Our text for the morning is found in the book of Exodus, the first chapter, the 15th through the 17th verse. It reads, the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. The gospel text is taken out of the book of Luke in the 18th chapter and the 15th verse through 16 and 17. And it reads, people were also bringing babies to Jesus for him to place his hands on them. When the disciples saw this, they rebuked them. But Jesus called the little children to him and said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Would you bow with me in just a word of prayer as we ask God to bless this effort? And God, we thank you for this awesome privilege. We do honor your name and give you glory for the preaching moment, for it is your word that you deliver unto the people. We ask that you indeed would be the preacher, for if you don't speak, there's nothing the preacher can say. If you don't touch, there's nothing the preacher can do. If you don't anoint, there's nothing the preacher can feel. So we offer all these things unto you. You get the glory. What we're after is a blessing. In Christ's name, amen. I want to preach something entitled, What About the Children? What about the children? The beginnings of this sermon came to me as I sat listening to an amazing New Testament scholar explain what she called a children's reading of the text. She said that children are very rarely the center of text and interpretation, and more often than not, they are simply an appendage and an afterthought, if mentioned at all. She had the audacity to claim that in the American context, while we list marginalized people in groups such as blacks, women, minorities, the LGBTQI community, immigrants, and the Latinx community and such, we do not mention children. She said that children are more often marginalized and left without voices in many places and particularly Relevant for us, they are seldom considered in sermons, in theology, in preaching, in lectures, papers, workshops, books, plannings, and the reading of texts. Most of the time, we exclude children. My ears perked up during her lecture because on May 4th, uh, 2018, we welcomed our first granddaughter, August Elise Dickerson, to the world. When she entered the world, the world changed for me. When I looked into her face for the very first time, in the face of that child for the very first time, I began to earnestly think about uh, looking at the world through her eyes, and it was a precursor, uh, an entree into my heart. So when the professor explained the children's reading of the text, I, I looked and remembered my granddaughter and what it might mean to have her at the center of the text rather than an appendage, I began to ask, what about the children? What about the children in this post-truth era? Lies, fake news, alternative facts, conspiratorial views of reality that don't line up anywhere near with any reality, present reality, real reality, and it presents a challenge of, for daily sanity for adults. 
And if it presents a challenge for sanity for adults, what do you imagine for children? How much more so for children? What about the children when a pandemic runs wild as we struggle to get ahead and get vaccines and get kids back in school and teachers? What about the children? Again, we're struggling as adults with the pandemic and COVID-19 and such. What about the children? In preparing this sermon, I looked at several lists of the chief challenges facing children all over the globe. Violence through indoctrination, poverty, life as a refugee, lack of access to education, child neglect, child labor, child sexual rape and molestation, child abuse, child prostitution, child trafficking and slavery, the military use of children, disease, hunger and climate change to name a few. What about the children? What does our church have to do with the children? What if all of our efforts and energies were focused on the children? What if we got busy and active for the children? What about the children? If we were to look carefully and critically beneath the sum total of the issues affecting our children, what we find at the base is fear in adults. I know this for some, this is old news, but I can never forget Donald J. Trump's despicable and inhumane zero tolerance policy for separating immigrant children from their families at the southern border. It was solely based in Euro-American fear. Now, admittedly, immigration issues are tough issues and there are no easy solutions. It is not possible to let everybody in, but neither is it moral to keep everyone out with inhumane treatment that includes placing people in cages. The fearful reality for some is that America is changing. And by the year 2040, Euro-Americans will not be the dominant group. There is a massive fear of living in this kind of diversity where European American people do not control the levels of wealth and power. And when they fear that they will not control the levels of wealth and power, one expression of that is people in cages, immigrants in cages. You see, it's hard change. Change is hard. Change is hard for all of us. The world changes. Our bodies change. Our relationships change. The church changes. The nation change. All things change. You cannot lie and dominate people forever. So European American domination of minority people, it has to change. Change is a part of life. I hate to admit it. I don't like change sometimes either. I don't like the fact that nothing stays the same. I don't like sometimes the fact that everything must change. Along with many thoughtful people, one, one writer, David Singer, in his book, The Unfettered Soul, uh, states this, that he believes that at the base level of the human psyche are only two emotions. One is fear and the other is love. Either we respond to any and all changes or anything else in fear or we respond in love. If we respond in fear, we won't like change. If we respond in fear, we will do all in our power to create a world that is predictable, controllable and safe. We will attempt to create a world that does not make us afraid. So we will do everything that we can to manipulate life for the purpose of not feeling fear or feeling afraid. We cannot face the natural unfolding of life because we can't live life that's not, we think, under our control. If it's something that we don't understand or we don't agree with or we don't like or something that makes us feel uncomfortable, then it is to be shunned, ostracized and segregated. Whatever does not disturb us is fine. It can be a lie, but if it doesn't disturb us, it's fine. Wonderful, fine. But that which disturbs us uh, anchors us in the reality of fear and we're angry and we're hostile and we're livid. When we finally figure out that we cannot arrange life so that it does not disturb us, we conjure the idea that life is against us. We play the role of victim. We begin to deal with life in terms of competition, jealousy, fear, particularly with that or those whom we don't understand. 
And to deal with the fear, we blame and scapegoat other people in a zero sum game. We say stuff like they out to get to get us. They out to take control of our way of life. We come to believe that our progress diminishes other people. Other people are the source of our discomfort and they have to be stereotyped, walled off, segregated, dehumanized, prejudged, hated, made less than human, and in some cases killed, ethnically cleansed, and exterminated. In this fearful environment, all political leaders have to do is appeal to our fears, play to our fears, heighten and exaggerate our fears, scapegoat minorities, the poor, women, LGBTQI persons, immigrants, blame other people for our problems. Then in a form of mass psychosis, we get a court system to adjudicate our fears, a legislate to legislate our fears, scholars to rationalize our fear, media to broadcast and spread our fears, and finally a God and a church to divinely sanction and offer cosmic validity to our fears. Fears, fears have arisen, fears are rising around the globe. And what's so alarming in the last few years is that these kinds of fear have come from underneath the surface and around the fringes and are exploding in America, fear, speaking of the seat of powers, fear, fear, fear located in, in the seat of powers, fear, speaking of the seat of power with massive levels of government machinery to implement its hateful and demonic schemes, please allow me to bring the king of Egypt to the homiletical stage. In our text in Exodus 1, the king of Egypt was responding in fear in a particularly dangerous fear, wielding massive levels of power and political machinery. In our text, Exodus 1 through 9, it says that a king arose that did not know Joseph and did not know the people of Israel. The king of Egypt said, these Israelites have become too numerous for us. We must deal with them shrewdly because if our enemies come against us, they will join our enemies and we will will have to leave our own country. They put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor, but they still multiplied. They came to dread the Egyptians, the Israelites, and they worked them ruthlessly, but they still multiplied. Then the king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, shipper and pure, that they were to observe Hebrew women in childbirth at the birthing stool. And if the baby came out a boy, Kill the baby. And if it was a girl, let the girl live. The text says that the midwives feared God and did not do as the king said. Shipra and Pua feared God. I searched for a simple children's reading of what Shipra and Pua feared God means. Oswald Chambers says this. The remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you don't fear God, you fear everything. I know that we're looking for a deep and profound exegetical analysis of the word fear, but children understand when you say Shipra and Pua feared God and did not fear anything else. Maybe Shipra and Pua thought that God intended to redeem the world through children. And if you kill the children, our chances at redemption are lost. Maybe for them, children were the center of the world and not adults. When asked, what about the children? They had an answer. Save the children at all costs. Keep the children alive at all costs. This was the gospel of Shipra and Pua. Save the children at all costs. In American culture, there was a person his name was Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, a minister, a clergy person, the progenitor of the popular children's television program, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. The New York Times columnist David Brooks wrote an op-ed titled Fred Rogers and the Loveliness of the Little Good. There was a documentary on Fred Rogers. For 30 years, Mr. Rogers opened his television show by going to the closet, putting on his sweater, and changing his shoes. 
It was a show for children as if children were the center of the world. He would say things like, you are special just the way you are. He would take their questions and comments with utmost regard. No, children can't fall down the drain in the bathtub. He would sing, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. He had a profound respect for the dignity of each child that was almost veneration. He loved and protected children. Brooks says he even touched politics in the civil rights era when black children were being thrown out of white swimming pools. Rogers and a black child bathed their feet together in a tub on national television. The gospel of Fred Rogers was that children are our superiors in that unless they are taught otherwise, they trust each person. They lack guile and children can admit simple pain, fear and vulnerability. Brooks says that what we need to remember as scholars and adults, parents, preachers, teachers, that deep and simple is far better than shallow and complex. Deep and simple is far better than shallow and complex. Rogers was deep and simple. Rogers drew on a long moral tradition that the last shall be first, that the small will be great, that the meek shall inherit the earth, that blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Brooks says that Trump and those globally like Trump represent a cartoonist version of the idea that winners are better than losers. The successful are better than the weak. Men are better than women. Whites are better than blacks. Americans are better than other nations and people around the globe. Americans are better than people around the globe. And it's not just Trump, any achievement oriented, success obsessed, materialist and consumerist culture can easily swing into pride, hubris, fear, which produce hateful behaviors among us. Brooks says we live in a time when public kindness is scarce. It's as if we had dumped our our fearful adult slime on children and try to entertain them with manic violence rather than build them up with radical kindness. Fred Rogers asks, won't you be my neighbor? Not these people need to get out or these people need to stay in their place or they need to go back where they came. No. Not they don't look like us. We the real Americans. Not take our country back? No. Won't you be my neighbor? He simply asks, won't you be my neighbor? I want to suggest that the gospel of Mr. Rogers is close to the gospel of shipper and pure and that the child is closer to God than the, the adult. I want to suggest that the sick are closer to God than the healthy. I want to suggest that the poor are closer to God than the rich. The hungry are closer to God than those who are filled and marginalized people are closer to God than the celebrated. Losers are closer to God than winners. The oppressed are closer to God than oppressors. Those of the global south are closer to God than those of the global north. I hope you know that this is the gospel of Jesus Christ, that children are closer to God than adults. You see, it says this in our text in Luke 18. It says the people brought their children and their babies to Jesus and the disciples hindered them. Fred B. Craddock, one of my favorite preachers, says it, way, says it this way. The, the people were bringing, Jesus was teaching and the people were bringing and get their, their children uh, to Jesus. And they're they closing in and the, the disciple says, can you get the children out of here? We're trying to have the kingdom. You know, can you get the children out of here? We're trying to have church. Can you get the kids out? You know, can you put them in the basement? Can you get these immigrant kids out of here? We're trying to have America. What? We're trying to have America. You got immigrant kids? Get these kids in cages. Get these kids out of here. They hindered and forbade the children from coming to Jesus. But Jesus rebuked them and said, do not hinder them. Don't put roadblocks in their way. For to such as these, 
belong the kingdom of God. The reign of God belongs to such as these. They own God's reign and you're trying to put out, you're trying to, it belongs to them. You're trying to put out the people who own the thing. You're trying, I mean, we like to spiritualize this text and remind ourselves that we must be as little children to enter the kingdom. And that's one reading of the text. But if you do a children's reading of the text, if you bring children to the center of the text, it reads like this. The reality is that we must be like them because they own the reign of God and already are in it while we adults have to repent to get in it. In a children's reading of the text, when Jesus says to such belong the kingdom of heaven, he means the reign of God is composed of literal children and of people who are spiritually like children. Children are in and adults have to repent. Let me say it this way. If we put the children in the center of the text, it's like this. The reign of God belongs to them. The buildings belong to, to the adults, but the children own the kingdom. The leadership positions belong to the adults, but the kingdom belongs to the children. The adults set up constitutions and Robert's rules of order as well they should, but the reign of God belongs to the kingdom. The adults have upstairs. They've got all the big people and the big worship and the kids are down in the basement, but the reign of God is in the basement with the kids. The adults have conferences and papers and books, journals and such, but the kingdom is better represented in the children's literature handed out in Sunday school. You cannot hinder the children for the reign of God is theirs, for to such belong the kingdom, such as the poor, the displaced, the immigrant, the stranger, the dispossessed, the left out, the sick, the bereaved, the broken, and the oppressed belong. the reign of God. So when are we gonna have our shipra and pure moment? When are we gonna tell the king, no, 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 we're, we're, no, 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 we're not gonna kill the children. We're not gonna abandon the children. We're not gonna throw away the children. When do we tell racism, no, 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 we will not have our kids with inferiority complexes. When will we say no? Our kids will be strong and well and alive and vibrant. Our kids will not be defeated by any force or power or demon or hate or discrimination. Our children will live. This is our, is our shipper and our pure moment. When are we gonna announce and implement a counter narrative of radical kindness to our children. When are we going to expand the children's budget? Oh, you got to see who we value in the church. Look, let's look at the adult budget. Then let's look at the children's budget. What, what's the difference? Are we spending more money on adults than we're spending on children? Let, let's look at the children's space and let's look at the adult space. The adult space is attractive and beautiful and wonderful. The kids are shoved down in the basement as an afterthought. What about the children? When are we going to say no? Nothing is going to take our children. Nothing is going to steal our children. No child molestation is going to take our children no raping, that's not going to take our children. No, we're going to protect our children. No, no, the king will not have our children. The culture will not have our children. Drugs and alcohol and substance abuse. No, you will not have our children. When are we going to get out and march and protest and stand for our children? What about the children? What about the children where you live? Are there any shippers and uh, pewers listening to me today? No. When I think about this, I, I think about do you remember when we were children? It's a song, a gospel song. When we were children, if we were without people who loved us, where would we be today? Do you remember that we were once children? And somebody loved us and 
Somebody cared about us. And somebody was chipper and pure. They would not let us die. Somebody fought for us, prayed for us, sacrificed love for us. Do you remember when you were children? Mr. Rogers went on stage to accept the Emmy, the Emmy's Lifetime Achievement Award in, award in 1997. And there in front of a star-studded celebrity and the creme de la creme of the glitterati crowd, he received the award, took a bow, and said, so many people have helped me come to this night. Some of you are here. Some are far away. Some are even in heaven. All of us have special ones who have loved us into being. Would you just take along with me 10 seconds to think of the people who helped you become who you are? Those who cared about you and wanted what was best in your life? He said, 10 seconds of silence. And then he lifted his wrist and looked at the audience and looked at his watch and said, I'll watch the time. There was at first a small hoop from the crowd, a giddy, strangled hiccup of laughter as people realized that he was not kidding. People realized that Mr. Rogers was not some convenient eunuch, but rather a man, an authority figure, who actually expected them to do what he asked. And so they did. One second, two seconds, three seconds. And now the jaws clenched and the bosoms heaved, the bosoms heaved, and the mascara ran, and the tears fell upon the beglittered gathering like rain leaking down a crystal chandelier. And then he said, whomever you've been thinking about, how pleased they must be to know the difference you feel that they have made. Thank you for allowing me all these years to be your neighbor. So many people have helped you when you were children. So many people have helped you be here. Some, some are still here. Some are far away. Some are even in heaven. All of us have special ones who have loved us into being. Would you just take along with me 10 seconds to think of the people who have helped you become who you are. I will watch the time. In the name of Jesus, what about the children? Amen and amen.